Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jacksonville History Show. I'm Harry Reagan. On this show, an interview with one of Jacksonville's broadcasting pioneers, Herb Gold. Here's the interview. I started off as a newspaper photographer. I majored in photojournalism in school, in mm -hmm. college. I went into the Navy, was stationed in Jacksonville. Uh, saw, before I went into the Navy, uh, television was in its infancy in the New York City area. But I could see what it was doing to the newspapers. I worked for a newspaper up there and saw what it was doing to the newspapers as far as advertising mm -hmm. and as far as, uh, uh, even though it was only on maybe four hours a day, uh, I thought this was going to be how news was delivered to the home. Even though I guess uh, in the early days it was more entertainment than news. Oh, yeah. There you was see the potential. There was a 15-minute newscast, and that was it. Uh, and that was on at 6 o'clock, from 6 to 6.15. That was the national news. And your original connection with Jacksonville was through the Navy. The Navy, and I uh, was going to be discharged in uh, 55, early 55. And in 54, I decided I had to uh, see about some interviews for television stations in, uh, in Jacksonville. Uh, I went to uh, Channel 36 was on the air at the time. Tom Gilchrist was the general manager, and I had an interview with Tom. They weren't hiring. Uh, I had an interview with uh, Harry Kalkinis, who you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the production manager at Channel 4 at the time. And I walked into his office, and uh, we had a, a, an interview, and they weren't hiring. Uh, at that time, uh, 12 was not on the air. Uh, they had the license. They weren't even building. Mm -hmm. And uh, Harold Cohen, who owned the radio station here in town, but he was also the news editor of the afternoon newspaper at one time. I think it was the Jacksonville Journal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a part owner of the, the Channel 12 that was coming on the air. And uh, somebody knew him and set up an interview for me. And I went over and talked to him, uh, gave him my resume. And he told me that he wasn't doing the hiring, but a Jess Kripe in Miami at WTVJ was going to be the general manager here. And he would send my resume to him. And I thanked him very much. And, I was discharged from the Navy and went back up to New Jersey. But I kept writing letters. So they said, uh, don't call us, we'll call exactly. you. Exactly. So All I right. kept writing letters uh, to uh, uh, Gilchrist, to uh, uh, Harry Kalkinis, uh -huh. to Jess Kripe, who was still in Miami. And uh, it, it sort of dwindled down so I knew that they, they were coming on the air. I wrote a letter a week to Jess Kripe, and I became pen pals with his secretary. <laughs> and uh, uh, in 57, in August of 57, I was coming down here on vacation, and just before I uh, uh, was getting ready to leave Patterson, New Jersey, I got a call from Harold Baker. Uh, he wanted me to send me, he wanted me to send him some copies of my work, uh, some samples. And I said, well, I'll be down there next week. I'll bring it with me. And he kept saying, no, 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 don't. I don't want you to come down. I just want to see your work. I said, no, I'm coming down on vacation. I will bring my work with me. And I had a uh, portfolio of, of still pictures since I was in uh, still photography at the time. And I came down, on, I arrived on a, uh, let's see, on a Sunday. And I had an uh, uh, interview, a meeting with uh, Harold Baker and Jess Kripe on Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon, they hired me. I flew back to New Jersey on Wednesday, put all my furniture in storage, uh, came back, moved in with my in-laws, and started work the following Monday. Wow. Uh, and that was two weeks before they went on the air. And one of the things that you had to uh, address, I guess, was making a transition from still pictures from to moving pictures. Still to moving, yeah. The, the, the thing that I had going for me, I guess, was from the, uh, uh, my stint in the Navy, I learned motion picture mm -hmm. uh, uh, part of photography and also how to process motion pictures. And 12 had, uh, had ordered and uh, was about to receive a uh, film processing machine that could uh, turn out a thousand feet of, of film at a time and uh, uh, 1,200 feet at a time, uh, which was something new as far as television stations in, in uh, Jacksonville was concerned. The only other uh, uh, machine like that was at a film company here in town, Russell Barton mm -hmm. Film Company. They were the ones that had the machine. Uh, so that, uh, since I knew something about that machine, that helped to get me the job. And it came in in pieces, and we put it together, mixed some chemicals, uh, went across the street, uh, when I say across the street from the studio where we're shooting, uh, there was a park mm -hmm. at the time, and uh, uh, another uh, person who had been hired by the name of uh, Bob Henry, uh, and he had some background as far as film was concerned, and we shot 100 feet of film, and we ran it through the processor, and lo and behold, we had moving pictures. 
Now, and the exciting thing about Channel 12 was uh, color. Yes. The, the, uh, uh, it was the first station in the country built for color from the ground up. There had already been stations on the air uh, uh, televising in black and white, and they'd convert to color. But the uh, 12 was the first station built for color. It was uh, what was at that time called the turnkey operation. RCA came in after the, the uh, bricks and mortar were in place. RCA came in and put all the equipment in, tested it, and uh, set it up, and then handed the keys to the, the engineers uh, that uh, Channel 12 had. What were the special problems uh, about color? Oh, uh, air conditioning was one. Mm. Uh, because of the size of the transmitter and, and the, uh, uh, the equipment. And more lighting? The heat, more lighting was another thing. Um, color balance, mm -hmm. uh, the equipment was, was very, very sensitive at the time. And, and uh, you know, uh, we're talking about the 1957 as compared to now when you walk around with your uh, cell phone and you take color uh, film uh, digital. And also, uh, uh, a very small point, uh, not very many people had color TV sets. No, very few. Uh, you had them in, uh, in shop windows. Uh, people would see it there. Now, once they saw it, they thought it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. They thought it was uh, absolutely tremendous, seeing color. In fact, one of the things that we did was, uh, from time to time, we would take the cameras out, and we would go to different locations so that people could see themselves in color. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we had monitors set up. That helped to sell television sets, color television sets, and, of course, it it helped to get us to get an audience. How much more would a color set cost than a black and white? Oh, at that time, uh, I'd say maybe a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars wow. more. They were they were expensive. That's why very few people had them, and it was something new. Yeah, it was something new. Uh, but the fact that that we were televising in color, and we didn't always televise in color. Uh, we had black and white cameras also, uh, so we did do some in black and white. Uh, when we went on uh, remote units, we took the remotes, we took the black and whites with us, or we took the color depending upon what it was going to be. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, uh, helped us along was uh, the ownership of the station. Uh, it was owned, the majority ownership was uh, Wometco, who owned WTVJ in Miami, and they had been on from, oh, I guess, year one, uh, the same as, as Channel 4 uh, was here, uh, and they owned the Miami market. Uh, so those people were uh, knowledgeable, and, and that helped us as far as what to do. Uh, when we went on the air in 57, we had a full-blown news operation. Uh, we had a news department, uh, new, not only news director, but we had, oh, I'd say maybe 20 people that just worked in the news department, uh, and that was from, from the get-go. So uh, September 1st, 1957, the station went on the air. That's right. And, uh, and there were, there were some, uh, you gave me some notes that indicate that uh, there were some tests before that oh, day. Oh, yeah. We, uh, for three days before, uh, we were at 7 o'clock in the evening, we were going to run a movie. And uh, Rusty Bruton, who had come up from Miami, he worked at TVJ in Miami, and he was the uh, program manager, uh, he put together a, a quite elaborate opening for this movie. And I, I, unfortunately, I don't remember what the, uh, the movie was at the time, but uh, he, he was directing this opening, uh, live opening in the studio uh, with the announcer, and, and uh, I remember there were dancing girls and everything else, and did the whole thing, and then went to roll the film, and the transmitter went off the air. And Rusty just got up and walked away, because there was nothing else he could do. <laughs> you know? uh, our people, when I say our people, our engineering department, once RCA turned the equipment over to them, uh, uh, had a lot to do because they too, it was, color television was new to them also. And they were working around the clock to get things going. And it got to the point that they were just wearing themselves out. And uh, we did have engineers come up from TVJ in Miami to, to help so that our guys could get some rest. Uh, fortunately, they were learning, uh, was TVJ uh, in color? Uh, TVJ uh, had color equipment, but they were not on the air yet with mm -hmm. color. Okay. But they, they knew as far as the equipment was concerned, and, and they had a, a, a tremendous engineering crew. Uh, and they, uh, so they sent engineers up and, and to spell our guys, uh, our engineers. And then September 1st, we went on the, on the air, and it was, we were off and running. So despite those uh, initial stumbles, uh, color uh, was a big deal. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, people knew, you know, knew about color television because there was, there was a big uh, discussion and a contest between uh, CBS and NBC as far as the type 
of, of color equipment would, that would be used. And RCA, NBC uh, won out as far as the uh, FCC was concerned. So people were aware of, of color television, uh, though it was you know, something new. But then once we got on the air and, and you know, not only were we doing the, the NBC programming, we were doing local programming in color also. And there must have been thinking on the part of producers and stations that uh, how's this going to look in color? We want to oh, have things that are really going to be absolutely. colorful. Absolutely. And here again, at that, this was before tape, so everything was live. Mm -hmm. uh, we would do uh, live Win dixie commercials where they would be cooking right in the studio. And I remember uh, 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 William Cook mm -hmm. Agency uh, had the uh, Win dixie account, and there was a lady by the name of Jocelyn Brown who worked for Bill Cook, and she would do the cooking. And, and she, you know, she was an announcer. She could do the commercials. And she'd be cooking uh, steaks. She'd be cooking uh, frying eggs, things of that kind. And you'd look at it, and you wonder, well, is that the correct colors? And the engineers would have to tweak the cameras a little bit to make it look as if that's what was on the plate in front of you. We did uh, uh, talk shows. Uh, we had invited guests in if anybody was, was passing through town. Any celebrity was passing through town. We had a live program they could be on. Uh, sports figures, live program they could be on. Uh, we did live programming. Constantly, uh, we did live programming. Uh, early in the morning, late at night, middle of the day, uh, live programming. And it was done in color. And a lot of remote We did a lot of remote broadcasting. One of the things that, that uh, uh, the, the, the nucleus of the, the people that put Channel 12 on the air, the nucleus, were from WTVJ in Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, they had worked there, and they were picked to, to put uh, uh, 12 on the air. They were used to doing remotes. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Orange Bowl, uh, they took their equipment to Cuba. Uh, at that time, you know, Cuba was open. Uh, they did uh, uh, a lot of different shows uh, from Miami uh, that the networks uh, originated from Miami. So they were used to taking their equipment out and, uh, all the time. And when we went on the air, that carried forward. Uh, at the drop of a hat, our remote truck would be on the road. And it's hard to overstate uh, how big television was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, before tape, you, you had to be there watching television oh, if you wanted to see the if show. If you wanted to see it, yeah, it was live. Mm -hmm. there, was, you know, there was no tape, it was live. Uh, and the next day people would talk, or at night, mm -hmm. uh, or the next day around the water cooler, they would talk about, did you see last night? Did you see this? Did you see that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, the only thing, the only time that, that uh, it wasn't live, it was film. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the network shows uh, were Most filmed. of the commercials were live. Most of the commercials were live. Uh, they started to do, uh, 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 car commercials were filmed because they could go to, you know, to exotic locations and do car commercials. Uh, but the, uh, most of the commercials were done live. Uh, and here again, you kept going. Yeah. If there was and a mistake. Inherent in live television is uh, mistakes. And right. You'd have rehearsals, mm -hmm. and, and you'd do a rehearsal. And if there was something that you know, wasn't right, the director would stop and say, everybody freeze. And everybody would stand still, and they'd say, uh, you know, oh, this would be over a PA system because he would not be in the studio. Mm -hmm. And he would say, uh, uh, Harry, move two steps to your right, because you were in the shot. Mm -hmm. And you'd move two steps to your right. He said, you, you know, draw a line on the floor or whatever. You don't step over that line. And let's try it again. Mm -hmm. And so that, that type of thing. But occasionally it would happen. Occasionally somebody would, would walk across the, back, the background who was not supposed to be part of the, the commercial or the show. So a lot of uh, local entertainment, sports. Yes. Uh, on sports. Not to mention, uh, well, you know, you mentioned news, which was an increasingly important part of uh, TV stations. But uh, talk about the uh, local entertainment shows. Entertainment shows, we had uh, the Glenn Reeve show. Mm -hmm. uh, Toby Doughty was on Channel 4 for a long time. Uh, Glenn Reeves was on Channel 4 uh, for a while, came over to uh, 12. Uh, and was on 12 uh, through William Cook Agency. And I have to mention my classmate, Johnny Tillotson. Johnny Tillotson was another one. Uh, I can remember Johnny coming in because Johnny, uh, uh, as you know, uh, went to University of Florida, mm -hmm. uh, journalism. Right. Okay. And at the time, journalism was not television. Mm -hmm. right. It was news media, right? It was uh, newspaper, it was photography. Mm -hmm. 
And I can remember Johnny, at that time I was a photographer, uh, and I had the, the photo lab, and I can remember Johnny coming in after the show, after the show, that can I use your lab to do my schoolwork? <laughs> and he would do the schoolwork, and then he'd go back to That's Gainesville. That's a great story. Yeah, yeah. Johnny Downey was a great guy, great guy. And apparently uh, still performing yes, in still, Europe? Yes, he's uh, still performing. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time when he left, uh, when, uh, when I say when he left Jacksonville, when MGM picked him up, he was the number one performer in Europe. Uh, he, would, he was scheduled to take, as you know, Pat Boone mm -hmm. was another one from, uh, uh, another sure. person from uh, uh, Jacksonville. And, and MGM had a stable uh, of uh, performers. And when one started to wane, they'd bring another one up. And Johnny Tillerson was in that line to be moved up. And he still, you know, today he still does concerts. And uh, a lot of uh, sports, uh, high school football. Was high school football. We, uh, you know, we were right around the corner from the Gator Bowl. Uh -huh. uh, Walt Dunbar had been hired from, uh, uh, he came sports down from Massachusetts. For many, many years. Yes, he was the sports director. And he came down from Massachusetts. He was a radio uh, uh, guy in Massachusetts. And he came down. And, and somehow he and I uh, just had the, the right mixture, the right magic. And uh, what we would do is we would go over on Friday nights at the Gator Bowl was uh, high school night. And we would go over and, and shoot 50 feet, 75 feet of film, uh, and edit in the camera. And when I say edit in the camera, you'd shoot a play and then turn around and shoot the bench, and then shoot another play. So you didn't have to actually edit when you got back to the station. And we'd get back to the station at about oh, maybe 10 o'clock for 11 o'clock uh, news show, and we were able to process the film and put it on the air. Well, it got to be that the, the high school coaches would keep the teams at the Gator Bowl, and they'd bring a little black and white television set with them so that the teams could see themselves mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the 11 o'clock news. Again, how dominant television was. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, we did that to, you know, basically uh, it was selfish. We wanted to naturally build an audience. Mm -hmm. uh, when we came on the air, when 12 came on the air, uh, the television landscape in, in Jacksonville was Channel 4. That was the landscape, and, and we they had a head start. Yes, a big head start. Yeah. Uh, just as you know, TVJ, uh, uh, WFLA in Tampa, mm -hmm. uh, they were you know three stations uh, in Florida that were on the air. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to climb up that ladder. Uh, as an NBC affiliate, we had uh, the AFL football. Uh, well, when you know when I came to uh, Jackson, I guess when you did also, it was the Washington Redskins. Mm -hmm. That if you wanted to see NFL football, you saw the Washington Redskins. That was it. Uh, so when we came on the air, NBC had the AFL. So we were showing the AFL games. So that was a change also. Mm -hmm. uh, those were the things that, that helped us to, to climb up that ladder and build that audience. You're watching the Jacksonville History Show, an interview with Herb Gold, one of Jacksonville's broadcasting pioneers. More of our interview after this. Now back to our interview with Herb Gold. Uh, back to news. Um, the, the, the stories that were dominating the news were uh, some difficult stories uh, in the area of civil rights and, uh, yes. and so forth. Very much so. so talk a little bit about uh, some of those. Uh, um, Klan meetings. Yeah. Uh, through a connection uh, that we had, uh, Bob Henry and I were invited to uh, Klan meetings, and we attended uh, three meetings uh, on the outskirts of, of Tampa. Uh, they had brought uh, somebody down, I think it was the Grand Wizard from Georgia to speak, and there was another meeting coming up, and uh, uh, well, before I get to that, when we went to these meetings, uh, we were assigned uh, a person. The Klansman was assigned to each one of us, and we were told, you don't make a move unless you tell him where you're going and which direction you're going. And they called themselves the Goon Squad. That's what they called themselves. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman was assigned to me in full regalia. And I said, I want to go this way, or I want to go that way to shoot. Fine, no problem. But if I start off by myself without saying anything, I had a hand on my shoulder. And that was fine for, uh, say, the, the three meetings. And we scheduled for a fourth meeting. And they sent word back that I was not welcome anymore, because they found out I was Jewish. Uh -huh. Okay. Originally, they thought my name was spelled G-O-U-L-D. 
and then they found out it was GOLD, and they found out that I was Jewish, and they said, you're not welcome here anymore. That's so, interesting. But, but uh, we did get, as I say, to uh, uh, attend three of the meetings. Uh, it was interesting. Yeah. Uh, I still have photographs. And that, there was that Axe Handle Saturday. It was Axe Handle Saturday, which was just terrible. Yeah. Uh, it was leading up. Uh, what was happening, of course, was the, uh, the sit-ins at the uh, lunch counters mm -hmm. and things of that nature. If you look at a map of Florida, and you hold the map up, uh, you've got Florida facing down like this. So we always used to say that the television signal traveled downhill mm -hmm. because Jackson was at the, is always at the top of Florida. So if, if uh, anybody wanted to talk to everybody in Florida, you'd start at Jackson work down. And uh, Governor Collins uh, called uh, when, when the segregation was uh, taking place for integration in the schools. Mm -hmm. And he uh, wanted a half hour at 7 o'clock, and he came into the station. And we had set up uh, a little living room set uh, with the American flag and the Florida flag. Uh, and uh, we had a table with some water set up on it. And he looked around and he said, I want all this taken out. All I want is a chair and a table. And I want to put this Bible on that table. And he, during the course of the uh, program, he would pick up the Bible and put it down. And basically what he was saying was, it's not only the law of the land, but it's the law of God that all men are created equal. And then, of course, it, uh, it cost him, when he did that, uh, it cost him as far as his future as a politician in Florida. Because when, when uh, his term of governor was up, you know, there was talk of him going to the Senate and things of that sure. nature. And uh, he ended up as head of the National Broadcasters Association instead as the executive director. And the uh, switchboard probably. Uh, oh, uh, did it ever. Did it ever. Uh, we had threats. Uh, uh, there was also a program that NBC ran called uh, Green Pastures. Mm -hmm. uh, they ran it twice. They ran it in uh, October of 57, but it got very little uh, uh, publicity. But it was an all Negro cast, an all black cast, uh, including God was played mm -hmm. by a black man. And it got very little publicity, pre telecast publicity. Uh, of course, afterwards, tremendous publicity. They decided to run it again in 59. And we as an NBC station uh, took it, and it was on 10 o'clock uh, at night. Uh, we got phone calls. Of course, there was uh, pre-broadcast publicity on it. A lot of phone calls saying, we're going to blow up the station and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. We'll blow up your tower. Uh, and we brought in guards to guard the tower. Uh, we had dogs roaming the station. Uh, went on the air. We were on about three minutes, and no feed from the network. Network went black. Uh, at that time, the, the signal was uh, uh, came to Jacksonville via coax and, and microwave, and just outside of Waycross, uh, someone had cut the cables at wow. the uh, the microwave, and we were out. Uh, we didn't have any NBC coverage from that point on, till about it took about eight hours till the next morning, and the reason we got it back, which was also an interesting story, uh, we found that the or we didn't find it, but the network evidently found it that there was another microwave uh, uh, link that came out of Georgia going to Gainesville, to the University of Florida, that was used for governmental use. It was something they were working on. But they were able to use part of that microwave to get it back, to get the signal back. Because all of Florida, once it was cut coming through Jacksonville, sure. there was no NBC signal in Florida at all. There was no public TV for a long period no, of time. No ETV. And right. but Channel 7 license was available. Yes. And uh, there was concern that it might become the ABC affiliate. Uh, at the time, there were just you know, the two major stations on the air, Channel 4 and Channel 12. Uh, 4 was CBS, we were NBC, and we split the ABC programming. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the way we split it was to offer ABC the best time period. So depending upon the time period. Or if, if uh, 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 CBS had good programming on the air at the time, Channel 4 would not preempt that for an ABC program. So we would go back and forth. Uh, there was talk of trying to get the FCC to, to reallocate uh, Channel 7 as a commercial station. And that way ABC would, would have a foothold in the market. Uh, Channel 4 and Channel 12, the ownership, then decided we had to get Channel 7 on the air quickly. Uh, Channel 4 uh, donated a lot of money uh, and also studio space. Uh, Channel 12 donated a lot of money plus transmitter space and antenna space. 
to get them on the air. Well, back to Channel 17. Uh, y y how long had the station been on the air when you arrived? 17 had been on the air, I guess maybe, oh, I don't know, eight, ten years, I think. I'm not sure. And uh, I, I guess there was, uh, initially there was a struggle because of being a UHF station. Big struggle. Yeah. Big struggle. Uh, you'd sit there at your house and, yeah. you know, move the antenna. Uh, you had bow tie antenna. Yeah. Which you put on a regular antenna, which Channel 17 w was giving away. Yeah. The, Nobody yeah. had them. Nobody had it. It was, it was yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it was a, it was a challenge. You got to remember this was before cable. Mm -hmm. right? So th this it was a challenge. The disadvantage has been eliminated by cable. Absolutely. But in those days, UHF had a big yes. disadvantage. Big big disadvantage. Uh, we were lucky to get uh, oh one two percent of the audience, mm -hmm. and we got a call from ABC that said, "Effective such such a date, you're no longer an ABC affiliate." Well, immediately we you know. The scrambling, and we got a call from NBC and said, "Hey, guess what? We're available." So yes, uh, we did do the switch, and and uh, it was uh, it was interesting because you were known as an ABC station. All your programming was ABC. All your advertising was ABC. All your promotions on the air was ABC. You had to change all of that. Uh, fortunately, we had a great group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, one lady who you, who you know, MJ. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Jo Trankler, she worked for us uh, right. in the promotions department and the uh, uh, programming department and, and production. And, and she worked one weekend because the switch was made on a weekend and took care of everything. Everything that, that had an ABC on it disappeared. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, boom, on Monday morning it was all. And that was an edited uh, interview of an oral history with Herb Gold, one of Jacksonville's broadcasting pioneers, uh, worked many years at Channel 12 and Channel 17. You can see a lot of our uh, oral histories with broadcasting pioneers on the jackshistory.com website, the Jacksonville Historical Society website. But for now, until next time, we're history. The Jacksonville Historical Society, preserving your city's history, protecting your city's treasures. Advocating the restoration of Jacksonville landmarks. Archiving a century of historical documents. Collecting rare photographs. Tens of thousands. Creating the Merrill Museum House, piece by piece. Restoring Old St. Andrew's Church. Receiving Florida Historical Society's top honors. Publishing historical books. Elegantly crafted. Producing video histories. Dramatically told. Educating our citizens for decades, enlightening the generations to come, sponsoring tonight's special television presentation, and offering you the opportunity to become a part of Jacksonville history. Call 665-0064, visit jackshistory.com, and become a member of the Jacksonville Historical Society, celebrating 80 years serving our community.